Hello and welcome to this sixth HEC Reskill Masterclass. Today we receive Igor Shishlov, lecturer at HEC Paris in climate change economics. Igor is also the head of climate finance at Perspectives. Uh, that's a consultancy and an advisory uh, group. And he's been researching and advising on climate policy for over a decade. So Igor is particularly well placed to discuss with you, our viewers, the importance or not of international climate negotiations. As you know, I'm sure we're only one week away from the 20th, 28th Conference of the Parties, uh, that's COP in Dubai, and the world is on fire. <clears throat> the question he'll be discussing for the next 20 minutes is, do such negotiations really matter? Then we will, of course, welcome your questions on this LinkedIn Live, where you can start sending us your queries in the comments part. Hi. Good morning. Hello, everyone. Bonjour, hello, hola, ni hao. Howdy. Explain the environment. Creativity is a social experience. You're not creative alone. Business and ESG must also be part of the solution. Today we're going to talk about things like trust and teams, and this is something that I've been studying for the past 15 years of my life. Hello and welcome everybody to this session on international climate negotiations. Well, I remember very well my very first COP that I attended more than 10 years ago and it was just like COP28, it was a COP in the Middle East uh, in uh, Doha in 2012. And I must admit um, I was quite surprised and even overwhelmed by the sheer size and magnitude of the event. Uh, indeed, um, international climate negotiations have evolved considerably over the past 30 years from meetings of country negotiators to something that looks a little bit more like a huge trade show with tens of thousands of people. And um, um, COP negotiations every year around this time attract a lot of attention and also a great deal of criticism. Well, indeed, uh, despite 30 years of negotiations, the emissions keep going up. Uh, the fossil fuel demand uh, is at its highest levels in human history and the temperature is breaking records every month. Uh, this year is going to be the hottest year on record and this is of course linked to uh, various extreme weather events, uh, wildfires, uh, floods, droughts uh, that tremendously affect uh, people's life, lives all over the world. And as, um, as the UN uh, General Secretary um, Antonio Gutierrez said, uh, humanity opened the gates of hell. Um, so really, have we achieved anything over the past 30 years? And do international climate negotiations really matter? This is a question we'll try to tackle today. And before we do it, let's take a look at the results of the poll that we launched uh, before the event. As you can see, um, the majority of the respondents think that climate change negotia negotiations do matter, but that they are not enough. Well, in this session, I will try to um, uh, take a shot at you know, answering the question and giving my take, and let's see if we uh, coincide in this um, answer. Now, in order to answer the question, I would like to take you on a journey in time and space. We have a time machine with us. Uh, and we're going to track uh, the evolution of the international climate regime over the past 30 years. And then we will arrive to Dubai, to COP28, which starts in just about a week, and try to understand what can we realistically expect uh, from that COP. Now, I will do my best to speak English and not the UN language, which includes, you know, a lot of uh, different abbreviations and acronyms, but I'll still have to use some specialized terminology, so please bear with me for the next 20 minutes. All right, now first, 
why do we need a multilateral response uh, to climate change? Well, there are several factors uh, that, uh, uh, that we have to consider here. Well, first of all, when we talk about climate change, we're dealing with a global public goods issue. The atmosphere is a global public good and everybody's using it. And every ton of CO2 emitted anywhere in the world is going to end up in the atmosphere eventually and contribute to global warming. So a unilateral action by one single country or even a group of countries is not enough unless we have everybody on board. Now another factor uh, that we have to consider is that we live in a globalized world, in a global competition, and we're facing the issue of what we call uh, carbon leakage. So for example, if a given country implements uh, very stringent climate policies, it may see um, uh, the production uh, of carbon intensive industry move overseas, or we may also see carbon leakage through trade. This is why, for example, the European Union is now introducing the carbon, carbon border adjustment. And then another important factor to consider is the issue of equity. Now, those countries that are most responsible for climate change historically, due to their historical emissions, are not those who suffer the most. And it's very important when we discuss climate change to give voice to those that are particularly affected. And this is another reason why we need uh, a multilateral process to deal with, uh, with climate change. All right, now uh, let's take a ride on our time machine and let's go back to 1992 and we are going to travel to Brazil, to Rio de Janeiro, where uh, at the Earth Summit uh, we had the first milestone of uh, international climate negotiations and it is the adoption of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change or the so-called UNFCCC. Now the main objective of the UNFCCC is to stabilize uh, greenhouse gas concentrations at a level that would prevent dangerous interference with the climate system. Now that sounds great on paper but it's not very specific. You know the UNFCCC didn't set any targets in terms of concrete temperature, uh, limiting temperature rise, nor in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. However, what the UNFCCC did is establishing a framework for negotiations and establishing the, let's say, the rules and the key principles uh, that will guide international climate negotiations for many years to come. The UNFCCC process, as many of you know, revolves around uh, the conferences of the parties, the so-called COPs that happen every year uh, around this time. Uh, but there is also a lot of work that's happening in between uh, the COP. So COP is just a culmination of the international climate negotiation process. An important factor is that the adoption of decisions at the COP is done by consensus. So imagine we have almost 200 countries around the world with uh, different national interests, very different energy systems, different political systems, and if you need to adopt decisions by consensus you can imagine how difficult it is because virtually any country ha may have a veto power. Now, the UNFCCC, as I said, also established uh, principles for international climate negotiations. And here I would like to highlight particularly um, three principles that I think are uh, the most important ones. So the first one is the so-called precautionary principle. Now, what the precautionary principle tells us is that the uncertainty uh, that we have about climate science should not preclude climate action. So in other words, uh, we have to take a cautious approach in the face of such an existential threat as uh, climate change. Now the second important principle is the so-called principle of common but differentiated responsibility. What it says is that essentially all countries and all greenhouse gas emissions around the world contribute to global warming but some countries bear greater historical responsibility because they emitted more in the past and because they are responsible for the current concentration of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and therefore, uh, these countries uh, have to act uh, faster and have to act uh, more decisively. And finally, uh, there is a third pr important principle, which is the right to economic development. Now, what the principle means is that essentially no international treaty or agreement on climate change should preclude a given country from 
you know, pursuing its development goals. And this is, of course, a very important uh, principle uh, for the emerging economies and uh, countries that are still growing. All right, now let's take again our time machine and fast forward five years to, uh, and we're going to travel to Japan this time. Uh, we're going to travel to Kyoto, 1997. Uh, this is when uh, the first agreement which had concrete targets in terms of emission reductions was adopted, the famous Kyoto Protocol. And the objective of the Kyoto Protocol was to reduce emissions by 5% for industrialized countries compared to 1990. Interestingly, uh, the Kyoto Protocol was designed as a cap-and-trade system. What it means is that every industrialized country received uh, a number of emission allowances or let's say emission permits and then these countries were allowed to trade on the international carbon market to trade those permits and the idea uh, behind the cap and trade system is of course to maximize the economic efficiency of achieving emission reduction targets so for example and remember we're talking about uh, 1990s uh, for example you may have countries in western europe with uh, relatively efficient economies where it's expensive to reduce emissions and at the same time on the other side you have uh, countries in Eastern Europe where there's still a lot of potential for uh, uh, improving the efficiency of uh, different industries. So in that case uh, a given country from Western Europe, say France, uh, could buy uh, emission allowances from a country in Eastern Europe that would reduce more emissions and like this we would achieve uh, our targets at a lower cost globally. Well, this is at least on paper. This is how the, how the theory goes. Now, did the system actually work with the Kyoto Protocol? Well, it really depends how you look at it, because in fact the objectives of the Kyoto Protocol were achieved. Uh, but the question is, were these objectives uh, ambitious enough? Uh, were there other factors that uh, influenced uh, emission reductions such as uh, the global financial crisis or introduction of domestic policies. Uh, so on the one hand the targets were achieved but on the other hand uh, the market under the Kyoto Protocol, the cap and trade system, eventually collapsed because there was not enough demand. Uh, Eastern European countries received uh, an excess of allowances, the so-called hot air, uh, where some of the Western countries such as the United States and Canada ended up not participating in the Kyoto Protocol. So uh, there was a misalignment between supply and demand and in the end the system uh, sort of collapsed. However, uh, one should note that the Kyoto Protocol did induce uh, a number of domestic climate policies. So for example in Europe uh, the introduction of the European emissions trading scheme was directly linked to the European objectives under the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, the Kyoto Protocol also improved what we call MRV, Monitoring, Verification and Reporting, uh, or uh, Carbon Accounting. So it improved transparency on how countries report on their greenhouse gas emissions, and it improved uh, information, and I would argue that it also helped uh, improve uh, trust in the, in, 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 the, in, in the system. However, as I said, it became clear that uh, uh, the cap and trade under, under the Kyoto Protocol faced, um, uh, didn't have enough demand and also it had a very small coverage at the very end of the uh, Kyoto Protocol. Actually the coverage was a bit more than 10% of global emissions and it became quite clear that, well, we need something global, we need something where all the countries are participating. And this is something, this takes me actually uh, to the next destination, to Copenhagen, to 2009, where a replacement to the Kyoto Protocol was supposed to be negotiated, a new agreement that would include all countries. Uh, however, um, developed countries really failed to show leadership in Copenhagen uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, emerging economies flatly refused to adopt any kind of quantitative targets to reduce emissions. So there was a very strong um, sort of uh, global north, global south divide. And there was also loss of trust in the whole negotiation process. And all these factors led to the collapse of the negotiations and essentially the new agreement um, was not achieved in, in Copenhagen.
What Copenhagen did achieve, however, there's one positive outcome that came out of Copenhagen, is the commitment of developed countries to provide climate finance in the amount of 100 billion US dollars annually by 2020. And we will come back to this number um, a little bit later. Now, after Copenhagen, it really took a few years to rebuild the whole negotiation process and to rebuild trust uh, among the countries. And this process eventually led us to COP21 in Paris in 2015, where the landmark Paris Agreement was adopted. Um, now, why the Paris Agreement is, is such an important treaty on climate? Well, first of all, the Paris Agreement uh, was the first treaty where we had a concrete objective in terms of limiting global warming. So the Paris Agreement says uh, that we should limit global warming to well below two degrees compared to pre-industrial times with efforts uh, made to limiting it to one and a half degrees actually. And in order to achieve that goal uh, we have to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions sometime in the second half of the 21st century. So it was also the first global objective on, on emissions. And uh, importantly, in addition to this uh, temperature and emissions objective, which we usually call mitigation, so climate change mitigation, uh, the Paris Agreement has two additional pillars. One related to adaptation. So we know that with the global warming that's already occurring, there will be a lot of uh, adaptation needs and improving resilience of uh, affected communities and affected countries around the world. So this is the second pillar of the, of the Paris Agreement, adaptation. And then importantly, there is a third pillar which is related to finance. So how do we finance our mitigation and adaptation objectives? And here the Paris Agreement in its uh, famous Article 2.1c says that uh, essentially we have to align all financial flows with low carbon and climate resilient development. Now, uh, what's interesting um, with the Paris Agreement is how the international climate regime evolved from more of a top-down system to a more of a bottom-up system with some top-down elements. And here I would argue that it's important to recognize that there is a trade-off between participation and stringency of the agreement. So we've seen with the Kyoto Protocol and the failure in Copenhagen that if you try to impose stringent targets on countries, your participation is going to suffer. And with the Paris Agreement, uh, with its uh, inherent flexibility, uh, it allowed us for the, for the global participation. So almost all countries around the world participate uh, in the Paris Agreement. And um, yes, we can say that we uh, exchanged essentially um, uh, stringency for global participation. And it's an open question whether it's, uh, it was a good or bad uh, idea, but what we did achieve uh, participation of all countries. Now, at the heart of the Paris Agreement, when I talk about this bottom-up nature, what does it actually mean? So essentially under the Paris Agreement, every country uh, is free to define its own climate strategy and its own emission reduction objectives uh, itself under what we call nationally determined contributions or NDCs and these are uh, strategic documents that every country has to present uh, internationally and has to revise every five years. So the last revision cycle was in 2020 and the next one is in 2025. And the idea here is that we know that the initial set of NDCs when we put them together is not sufficient to put us on track to uh, two degree let alone one and a half degree uh, trajectory. But uh, the Paris Agreement um, incorporates what we call a ratchet mechanism. And the ratchet mechanism essentially says that uh, the revision of every NDC has to uh, increase ambition. So every, every, uh, every NDC, every new NDC that a country presents uh, has to have a more ambitious emission reduction targets. And uh, industrialized countries must have uh, quantified targets, whereas uh, developing countries have to move over time towards having uh, absolute uh, quantified emission targets. And um, finally an important element is what we call a global stocktake. Uh, this is an exercise which is taking place every five years uh, 
and uh, it takes essentially a measure of where we stand with regards to achieving the three targets, uh, the three key objectives of the Paris Agreement. Remember, mitigation, adaptation and finance. And this actually takes me now to uh, Dubai, to COP28, uh, because in COP28 uh, we are going to conclude the very first uh, global stock take. So as I said, the global stock take takes inventory of where we stand with regards to mitigation, adaptation and finance. And there was a long technical process of collecting information, collect, uh, collating different reports. There was a technical report on global stock take that was published in uh, September. There were also a number of other reports such as the emission gap report by the UNEP and uh, also reports by the IEA that contribute to the, to the global stock take. And what the global stock take tells us essentially is that if uh, all um, objectives under the NDCs that are not conditional on international finance are implemented, well, we are heading to something like 2.9 degree warming by the end of the century. So we're really missing the objectives of the Paris Agreement. If the conditional elements, so those elements of NDCs that are conditional on international climate finance uh, are implemented, then we're heading to something like 2.5 degrees. And then if all net zero pledges are implemented, big question mark, uh, you know, whether they are going to be implemented, then we're heading to something like two degree warming by the end of the century. Now one can argue, well, we're really off track and it's true, we're off track. However, uh, one should also remember that before the Paris Agreement, so I remember more than 10 years ago, we were actually heading to something more like three and a half degree and, and even more of global warming. So we cannot say that nothing uh, was achieved. Uh, we really shaved off, uh, you know, uh, half a degree or even more uh, from, the, from the temperature projections, but it's still not enough, definitely far from enough to, uh, to achieve the targets. Now, the outcome uh, of the global stock take uh, may be either a binding COP decision or sort of a weaker uh, political uh, declaration. And we will see how it's going to unfold in Dubai. Now, another important topic, of course, which is going to be discussed at COP28 is climate finance. The 100 billion climate finance target that I mentioned earlier was not achieved. Uh, supposedly, according to the official numbers, it is going to be achieved in 2023. But there are a lot of observers who actually question the official numbers and uh, say that even uh, those official numbers are grossly uh, overestimated. And finally, on finance, the new target on climate finance is going to be adopted actually next year, but hopefully this year at COP28 we're going to advance uh, the discussions. And the last important topic uh, that is going to be discussed at COP28 is of course related to adaptation and loss and damage. So hopefully we're going to see some progress on the discussions on global ad uh, goals on adaptation. And there are a lot of open questions regarding how do we actually measure uh, progress on adaptation and most importantly how do we mobilize enough uh, finance uh, which is currently lacking severely for uh, adaptation. And the loss and damage fund, uh, this is something that was agreed at the last COP. Uh, however, the nitty gritties and all the modalities of how this fund is going to function, uh, this is something that will have to be ironed out at COP28 in uh, Dubai. All right, now um, what can we realistically expect um, coming to the conclusion? So in the best case scenario, we're going to have the conclusion of the global stock take with a strong uh, decision, COP decision on ambition raising. Uh, hopefully we're going to have an agreement on the loss and damage fund and funding uh, arrangements and uh, progress on the discussions on the overall uh, climate finance um, uh, targets. All right, um, so I hope that I managed to give uh, um, a nuanced picture of what is uh, what the international climate negotiations are and what we can uh, realistically expect. There are also some um, side discussions that go, let's say, beyond the, uh, the official uh, COP agenda. Uh, discussions related to, um, you know, tripling renewable energy, doubling energy efficiency by 2030. Of course, phasing out fossil fuels is going to be quite an important topic 
and here um, there will be really heated discussions, I think, on the exact language uh, that is going to go into the COP. Would it be phase out, phase down of uh, fossil fuels? And well, we can discuss this also during the Q&A session. Uh, but overall, uh, I wanted to, uh, to give you this kind of picture about you know, the, the good, the bad and the ugly of international climate negotiations. And coming back to the question that we asked in the very beginning, uh, I personally think that climate negotiations do matter. However, we need to realistically understand, you know, what we can really expect because climate negotiations do not reduce emissions themselves. The emissions are reduced domestically in the countries thanks to uh, different climate policies, thanks to the action by the private sector and the broader uh, society. So the hard work is really, the hard work begins, you know, after the COP ends. Um, so to sum up, I think international climate negotiations do matter, but let's not expect miracles uh, from that COP. And uh, with that, I conclude and I really look forward to receiving your questions. Thank you. Igor, thank you very much for that very dense and important uh, structuring around international climate negotiations. Um, your time machine took us back to uh, 1992 and it, it was important for me to uh, hear that date because I just happened to be at this Earth Summit in Rio as a cub reporter for RFI. And like many there, I felt that this was a, a groundbreaking mm. event. I mean, we had Cuba's Fidel Castro saying that it wasn't the rhinoceros that was an endangered species, it was the human race um, 30 <laughs> years ago. Um, but was it really the first such international climate uh, event? Uh, or is, was there an awareness of this issue beforehand? Mm. Yeah, it's a great question, Daniel. So, it was definitely not the first, but I think it was a groundbreaking moment in terms of bringing climate change really to the top of the international uh, political agenda. Mm. But uh, definitely the knowledge on climate change uh, and climate science dates back many years ago. And in fact, the uh, greenhouse effect was first discovered and described back in the 19th century in 1859, I think, by John Tyndall. So, and, and then the, uh, the climate science was basically settled around 1960s, 1970s. There were still some uncertainties around the relation between, the exact relation between greenhouse gas emissions and uh, temperature increase or the global warming potential of different gases. 
but uh, the, the basics of, of climate science were already settled back then. And uh, what's quite ironic is that back in the days, uh, some of the best climate science was actually done by scientists and researchers that worked for oil and gas companies, as we're learning now, uh, you know, discovering some of the documents from, uh, from, from those times. Um, uh, there's been a couple of um, peer-reviewed publications that came out recently analyzing what oil and gas companies knew back then. And uh, it's actually very interesting, for example, the Exxon, Exxon Mobil's uh, cl um, climate models from 1970s are, were shockingly precise if we compare their models to, you know, to the observed uh, climate change. Uh, they were shockingly precise. So uh, they had quite a lot of information on climate change, but unfortunately preferred to hide it uh, from the public and even actively obfuscate climate science. So I think that's one of the reasons why uh, it took us so long to, uh, to take climate change to the top of the political agenda. There's a lot of resistance um, from the incumbent industries. Yeah, sad real politics and real economy there talking once again. Mm. The reason I have my laptop uh, in front of me is because there's been dozens of questions that have been coming in and I've chosen a few from, uh, they range from people in Mexico City to New Delhi. And uh, Zurinia Bidoreta actually uh, writes in from Mexico asking what you think about the fact that COP28 is being held in a major oil and gas producing country the president of the COP is also the CEO of the Abu Dhabi <laughs> National Oil Company. So her question is around conflict of interest. As you're aware, the UAE controls mm. around 6% of the world's oil reserves. Yes, uh, well, great question. Thank you, Zarina, for this uh, great question. Well, uh, first of all, uh, one needs to understand that the location of the COP uh, rotates uh, according to the, to the UN system. So. Uh, at some point, uh, a COP has to take place in, 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 in the Middle East. And uh, in fact, um, on, on the positive note, I would say that uh, the UAE is probably one of the more advanced uh, countries in the, in, in the Middle East on climate. Uh, they've done quite a lot on, on renewable energy. Uh, however, um, yeah, and basically, uh, uh, you know, th th there's no place probably on earth that you couldn't criticize because, for example, you know, the United States is the biggest oil producer in the world, but I'm sure there wouldn't be such an amount of criticism if a COP would take place in and the, the United States. And the controversial fracking, of course. But, so. but that said, I think the bigger controversy is not the, the, the location itself, but it's, um, it's, it's, it's the topics uh, that I prioritize prioritized and um, of course the presidency. There was a lot of controversy around uh, the COP president uh, who is the, um, uh, the Minister of Industry, Sultan uh, Al Jaber, who also happens to be the CEO of Abu Dhabi oil and gas company. Mm. So there is a valid question on the conflict of interest and uh, if you ask me, I would definitely prefer to see uh, someone else as the, as the COP president, for example, the, the environmental minister. And uh, this also brings me to the question of the, the fossil fuel lobby, which is, um, I think we've seen, you know, the record number of fossil fuel lobbyists already at the last COP in, uh, in Egypt, in Sharm el Sheikh. And there is a question of, uh, you know, whether uh, the, the whole process is actually being, uh, being captured uh, by, by the fossil fuel lobby. Well, I would say that uh, probably it's not being completely captured, of course, but there is an influence. And I think uh, it shows us, it's, it's not only the problem of the COP itself, I think it's a problem of uh, climate policy in general, also, you know, domestic climate policies. And uh, indeed, if we look at what the, uh, what the fossil fuel industry, major oil and gas companies, what their investment plans are, well, we will see that they are spending only around 2% uh, they are planning to spend only around 2% of their investments on, uh, on, on renewables and advancing the energy transition. So it's, uh, it's, I think it's a great question and uh, it's, it's definitely a valid concern, you know, to, to what extent uh, the process is being captured by, uh, by the fossil fuel lobby. Moving on, Igor, um, you mentioned side deals in your initial mm. presentation of the masterclass. And um, Dana writes in uh, from Beirut, Lebanon, uh, uh, asking, what these side deals and who 
are, are involved in these exchanges uh, that I think mm. uh, you believe will grow uh, at the COP28. COP uh, it's not just, uh, in other words, the politicians and government representatives there. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And in fact, as I mentioned earlier, you know, international climate negotiations evolved significantly. So they evolved from smaller meetings of uh, country representatives that, that try to agree upon something into uh, bigger uh, events, including, uh, you know, many different stakeholders. And also, as I mentioned, uh, the decisions at the COP are taken by consensus. And you can imagine how difficult it is to get all the countries around the world agree upon essentially anything. So I think this is why we are seeing over the past several years, we've seen a growing number of what we call side deals, uh, meaning that a smaller group of countries would agree and take a certain commitment. Uh, and I think, well, one good example of such a side deal is um, at COP26 in Glasgow. There was a statement on, uh, on the energy transition and essentially a commitment to phase out international public finance for fossil fuels by the end of 2022. And this is a commitment that was signed by uh, 40, almost 40 different countries. Uh, however, of course, it doesn't have the same, uh, let's say, uh, strength. And we've already seen some of the countries who signed up to this commitment actually uh, breaking their, their promise. And this is one of the topics we're actually working together with my colleagues at Perspectives. We're looking at phasing out international public support uh, to fossil fuels, including through uh, you know, multilateral development banks or export credit agencies. And um, we are, we're working with a whole community of researchers and NGOs trying to make those countries accountable and trying to really push them to uh, fulfill what they promised. Are, are these side deals where uh, non-profit and non-NGOs uh, actually become involved in any way or it's really governments? Yeah, well, it, it depends very much on the side deal and on the topic. So it's not only governments. We've seen uh, different initiatives that come out of COPs coming from the private sector, mm -hmm. uh, coming from the financial sector, for example, the uh, Glasgow Financial Alliance on Net Zero, uh, where you have uh, you know hundreds of financial institutions that commit uh, to Net Zero. Now, uh, once you, however, once you you know dig into what's really behind the commitments, the devil is really in the detail always. Mm -hmm. So some of them have higher ambition, some of them have lower ambition, and I think what's really crucial is not only making commitments, uh, but, but but actually um, implementing them and uh, actually doing what you promise. I remember one of, um, uh, one of the colleagues uh, once said, you know, they're making so many commitments, why don't they make just one single commitment to implement all the past commitments? And that would be already a great, you know, <laughs> step forward. <laughs> Let's move on a bit. Um, mm. Rezvan Velayati, uh, who is from in, in France, mm -hmm. uh, he's a PhD researcher um, and he asked, how would you see the prospects of open and collaborative innovation practices helping policymakers? Well, I think it's uh, the, the innovation is definitely at the heart uh, of the energy transition. Uh, you know, we need uh, we need innovation policies to enable those technologies that are still at its infancy. Uh, this is what happened, for example, with renewable energy. We've seen the costs of renewables uh, plummet over the past uh, you know, decade or two decades. And this is, uh, this is a policy-driven innovation story, That's you know, funny. thanks to the uh, essentially subsidies, feed-in tariffs that were provided, uh, well, first in Germany and European countries and then in China leading to uh, increasing economies of scale. So innovation is really crucial and we, we have uh, many other technologies that we are going to need for, uh, for the energy transition, such as uh, green hydrogen, uh, you know, store, uh, energy storage, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, all these technologies require innovation and uh, they require a collaboration between you know, both public and private sector. Well, questions are coming in thick and fast. Unfortunately, <laughs> we are running out of time. I think I have one more, and that's from Ineta Vanaga in Latvia, mm -hmm. who says that um, cr climate finance has been a crucial aspect of international climate negotiations. And he was wondering um, if you could discuss the challenges and opportunities in the discussions around financing at COP28. 
Yes, so finance uh, has always been a thorny uh, issue. As I mentioned, there was a commitment uh, a few years ago to provide 100 billion US dollars in climate finance to help uh, countries in their uh, mitigation and adaptation efforts. And this commitment, unfortunately, was not met. Uh, even according to the official uh, data from the OECD, we reached something like 83 billion. Uh, they are saying now with some uh, data which has not been published yet, but probably we will reach 100 billion uh, 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 this okay. year. Uh, but even this amount is definitely not enough to address the, uh, uh, you know, the needs, uh, adaptation and mitigation needs um, in, in, in the global south. And as I also mentioned, uh, there is a lot of criticism of this number uh, because um, some observers say that, well, you cannot just count all the finance you provide, including loans that may come at market lay, uh, rates. You cannot count them at face value. You should only count the concessional component. And um, some observers, uh, like Oxfam, for example, uh, they say that, well, the real value of international climate finance is around 25, 30 uh, billion. And the goal also doesn't take into account inflation, which has been uh, on the rise in the past uh, couple of years. So. Uh, the, the, the question is really hard and also I think it's very hard particularly now because we live through a multi-crisis. Uh, we have now, you know, biggest military conflicts in Europe, uh, of the war going on in Ukraine, uh, the, uh, the war in the Middle East. We have, uh, you know, the, the, the rising inflation. So there is sort of, the, there are a lot of factors that um, that contribute to sort of resistance of uh, developed countries to provide more climate finance. And so I think there's going to be a lot of heated debates at uh, uh, COP28 around it. And I also think that um, maybe just one last thing on climate finance, and this is related to the loss and damage fund, uh, which we're really struggling to, uh, to fill up. Uh, we may need to find alternative uh, and some innovative instruments to raise uh, finance, for example, for loss and damage. And well, together with my colleagues, we've been uh, we've been working on this topic. Actually, we published um, uh, a report on loss and damage finance instruments, and I think uh, there's going to be some notes to the to the event. So maybe we can put some of the links, and those who are interested to learn more uh, about climate finance can then dig deeper uh, into these topics through the, some of the reading materials. Well, viewers, as you can guess, uh, Igor uh, Shishlov will be there in Dubai, and we look very much forward to uh, your return, where you'll give us uh, some of your points and analysis uh, of uh, this very intense event. Um, that's unfortunately all the time uh, we have for uh, today. Uh, thank you very much, Igor Shishlov, uh, and um, I'm looking forward to uh, following uh, the November, well, it begins November mm -hmm. the 30th, uh, the uh, the whole um, big event, 70,000 people will be there. And also I invite uh, our viewers to follow your consultancy work uh, with perspectives mm -hmm. on aligning uh, public and private finance uh, with uh, the Paris Ag Agreement. Uh, we'll be putting some of the references on the web pages uh, on uh, LinkedIn and YouTube, as well as knowledge at HEC. Meanwhile, please tune in again for our next Rescale Masterclass, where we're hoping to have another guest uh, returning from uh, Dubai, and that is François Gimène, who uh, will be uh, talking about his experience there. He's a specialist on impact of climate change on refugees and migration, and one of the co-authors of IPCC. So you'll be actually coming back, uh, discussing that with him next time. Until then, viewers, thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you for having me. Hi. Good morning. Hello, everyone. Bonjour, hello, hola, ni hao, howdy. Explain the environment. Creativity is a social experience. You're not creative alone. Business and ESG must also be part of the solution. Today we're going to talk about things like trust and teams, and this is something that I've been studying for the past 15 years of my life.